Mathieu Desnoyers. I'm uh, from uh, Efficios. Uh, and I, I'm presenting with uh, Julien Defosse, also at Efficios. So uh, we are here today uh, to uh, talk to you about tracing. Uh, so if I can give a relatively shorter title than this one, uh, it could be uh, said as uh, how to make tracing uh, usable by mere mortals. That would be the short version of it. Um, so uh, I maintain a couple of projects uh, around tracing and uh, uh, high efficiency, low uh, impact uh, data structures. Uh, and uh, Julien uh, uh, maintains a latency tracker, LTTNJ analysis. Uh, this latency tracker is the main project we're going to present today uh, in the LTTNG talk. So, uh, the content of this presentation, so we are going to compare a little bit the approach of trace buff buffering and in this aggregation. So when we talk about uh, tracing, just as a reminder for everyone, uh, so we're really talking about gathering information about uh, a system that's currently executing, both from the kernel and from user space, in order to gather a sequence of events uh, that we can then use to do uh, analysis on what happened on the system. Uh, so we're going to compare approaches uh, with uh, buffering and without buffering, so in-place aggregation. Uh, and then we're going to discuss what we can do by combining those approaches and present uh, demo demos. So a few words about trace buffering. Uh, so uh, basically, so we store event into a, a in-memory array buffer. Uh, the analysis is uh, usually performed at post-processing. Uh, and one nice uh, uh, effect of, uh, of this is that you can perform multiple analysis, uh, analyses uh, on the same recorded trace. Uh, so uh, from that same information, you can look at it from various angles. Some examples are uh, perf, uh, ftrace, LTTNG. Uh, and Julien is going to show uh, uh, just that. So, so just to, to give you an idea, when you, when you gather a system trace, it's usually associated with uh, uh, loads and loads of information, uh, which can put off uh, a lot of people, and that's understandable. So Julien is currently taking a two-second trace, uh, and it's, we're currently viewing the, the, the translated text log of a two-second trace. So as we can see, there are lots and lots and lots of kernel events that have been generated uh, during those two seconds. So, people who are not uh, OS expert uh, might have a hard time on make, really making sense of that trace and doing some, something useful with it. Um, so, as an example here, I mean, we have the syscall entry, syscall exit for reads and writes. Uh, so, we have uh, some detail about the content of the syscalls. So, this is the easy part. But then we also have the uh, internal detail of uh, the, uh, the external, so the scheduling events, for instance. Okay, so compared to trace buffering, if we talk about in-place aggregation uh, done by a project like EBPF, D-Trace, System Tab, uh, and I, I'm, I'm talk, talking generals and not specifics there, I'm really talking about what their, those projects are best at, right? So in-place aggregation, uh, so the analysis is done at runtime directly using the event input, uh, so it's really done in the kernel, so it's not buffering any information. And uh, so, so the one advantage is that it provides higher level information than the, the long trace that we have seen. However, this advantage is that you have to know beforehand what you're looking for. Okay. So what we're presenting here, uh, so rather than presenting that as competing tracing solutions, here I really want to stress that by com combining those approaches, uh, we can create much more powerful tools. So this is uh, the uh, flow diagram of the, the workflow we're presenting today. So uh, we're going to present in more detail the latency tracker, which fits into the aggregation tool uh, section, uh, which we're going to use to uh, trigger wake, uh, basically uh, trigger wake up. So we're going to awaken a script, uh, and what the script is going to do, it's going to gather snapshots of uh, detailed traces. So we're going to use LTTNG to capture traces only in memory and always overwrite the oldest information. 
uh, and we're going to use the trigger scripts to snapshot <coughs> what was in memory when the latency tracker found something unusual. And then we're going to present LTTNG analysis, which is performing offline trace analysis on the captured snapshot. And then trace compass, the graphical trace analysis, uh, uh, graphical interface, and uh, bubble trace to view the traces as a, as a text log. So the latency tracker, so this is a fairly recent project. I think it's uh, started two years ago, approximately. Uh, so this is still in alpha phase. So if you guys want to try it out, it's uh, its, its own standalone uh, set of uh, its a set of kernel modules. Um, so uh, please provide feedback on this. Um, so uh, it's a kernel module that tracks down uh, latency problems at runtime. Uh, it provides a simple API that can be called from wherever in the kernel, and we'll discuss later on what could be done to integrate that with EBDF scripts, for instance. Uh, and it can currently work on trace points, k-probes, netfilter hooks, and uh, already hard-coded calls. Uh, it does keep track of entry exit events, and it calls a callback whenever a user-specified threshold has been uh, reached or uh, uh, gone over. So the API, API is pretty simple. So you can create a tracker, specifying a threshold, a timeout, and a callback to call. And then you feed event in and event out uh, calls. Uh, from the instrumentation of your kernel. Uh, so you pass as a parameter a tracker and a key that you specify. So that key is going to be used to match the in and the out pairs. Uh, and it's going to be used to calculate the, whether the threshold has been met uh, and then call uh, the callback. So a bit more detail about uh, what our design goals were. Uh, so it had to be low impact, low overhead. So in order to do that, we created uh, our own custom memory locator. So it, it implements uh, log-free per-CPU per free lists, uh, and you uh, implements uh, uh, pre-allocated new mod pools uh, whenever the free list uh, per-CPU need to be replenished. Uh, so we can, the user can specify that if they want to, it to kind of automatically extend uh, if uh, more memory is needed to track state. Uh, so it's user configurable, and it's a worker thread that is going to do uh, this uh, kind of a memory pool extension phase. It's not done uh, in the trace execution context. Uh, and before 3.17, we, need we needed to implement our own custom uh, kind of call CU worker thread uh, to avoid the uh, wake-up deadlocks that were present uh, otherwise when we instrumented the scheduler. However, from 3.17 uh, onward, we can use caller CU scan. Uh, for per uh, simple advising. Uh, so that's for allocating nodes. Uh, so, uh, and then for the state tracking per se. Uh, so what we do, so we, when we add an event in, we allocate a, an event node. We place it in a hash table uh, uh, at a given key. And then when we have a matching event out, we're actually doing another hash table lookup uh, with that key, removing it checking the, the time delta and basically uh, reclaiming it. So the state tracking uh, is done in a hash table and we actually ported the user space RCU hash table to the Linux kernel to do that because what it provides is really log-free insertion and log-free removal as well as wait-free uh, lookups which allows all this to be uh, called from NMI context uh, which can, could not be done if we need, uh, for instance, uh, per bucket locking for hash table or thing like, things like that. So the, the latency trackers that we have implemented so far that are part of the latency tracker project as examples, I think. Uh, so there's block layer uh, tracker, which uh, is going to track uh, from block layer request issue to completion. Uh, we have a tracker for network to look at the network stack uh, from socket buffer received to consumption by user space. The wake-ups from wake-up to next scheduling of a thread. Off CPU time from preemption blocking to the next execution of the thread, IRQ handler, entry to exit, and system call, entry to exit. So this is implemented today. Uh, and then, so, so those are the kind of, so the general case is really to track from one entry to one exit, and I mean the previous example are quite easy to pair. But then if we're really interested to look at delays in a system, what we really want to do 
is to follow execution chains. For, for instance, from the arrival of an interrupt, uh, so a, a hardware, a, a key precedent is uh, arriving and the, the, the kernel is being told that an interrupt has been raised. So from the uh, interrupt under execution, sometimes going through soft tire queues and then waking up user space. Uh, that's a simple case, but then we have other cases where you, a user space thread can awaken another thread to perform some work. So those chains can get pretty long. So what we have created on top of the basic latency tracker with in and out events is basically a state machine that tracks those, uh, those state changes. So what the online critical path analysis does, so it measures response time in the system, um, so it follows uh, the execution context uh, and the wake-up chains uh, within a kernel module. Uh, so we have uh, a model of both the mainline kernel and the preempt 30 patch. Uh, the preempt 30 patch is a bit uh, more convoluted because the interrupts are handled uh, by, uh, by threads. So, the, uh, so basically we can follow NMI, IRQ, soft IRQ, wake up scheduling chains. Um, so the idea is we can follow the critical path from uh, an interrupt, whether it's a, it's a timer interrupt or it's a, a network interface, Wi-Fi interface, down to the completion of uh, the associated task in user space. Uh, and we can then perform user-defined actions when latencies uh, are met that are higher of, uh, than a spe specified threshold. So uh, there are a few uh, nuts that can be used to configure it. Uh, the latency threshold, of course, that we're interested in. And then we can apply filters to those chains. So, whether, so we can specify that we're interested in a specific user space task by name, PID, uh, whether only real-time tasks are interested, interrupt source. Uh, so, so, and there are some filters where uh, we, we don't know at the beginning, uh, we cannot apply them. I mean, we can have various interrupt sources that are going to end up affecting a specific process. So we track everything until we can filter on uh, that specific uh, process, for instance, if a filter process, process filter has been specified. Then there are criteriums where to, to consider when the chain can, can stop. Uh, one of them is when the target task starts to run. And another criterion that can be applied is that the chain stops whenever a target task is blocking. Uh, we can also instrument user space, so we expose a kernel API, uh, API for that. Uh, so that user space can tell the latency tracker uh, that its work has begun and its work has completed uh, and pass a key along that. Uh, so we can basically match the beginning and the end of work in user space for complex asynchronous use cases where let's say the, the work can start from a given thread and then complete much later on on another thread after having done some, some I.O., some user space level, uh, 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 wake up synchronization and things like that. We don't care about it. All we care about is matching the, the work start and the work end. Uh, so, uh, if we can go back a few slides to the diagram, uh, the flow diagram. Yeah. Uh, so, I've just discussed the latency tracker. Now, I'm going to tell a bit about uh, LTTNG and how it's used in that context. So, LTTNG is going to be used for flight recorder tracing. So, so, we track latencies, and then what we want to do, to do is to have much more information about what led to those latencies. So LTTNG, the kernel and user space tracers. So they are low overhead tracers, they provide correlated kernel and user space tracing. Uh, and they're both based uh, uh, on ring buffers uh, in shared memory. Uh, they provide, so uh, users can do user-defined filtering on the event arguments. Uh, it can be done system-wide or uh, specific process IDs can be tracked. Uh, it uh, can optionally gather uh, performance monitoring unit counters uh, from perf. Um, and associate that with the events, and we support other uh, context information that are optional, uh, such as uh, the, the, the PID can be saved with every event, uh, and many others. Um, so it, uh, it's pretty flexible, so it supports uh, outputting the trace uh, to disk, uh, doing network streaming, live reading, but the, the case we're going to focus on here is in-memory flight recorder. So the idea is, as you run your workload, 
you only write your detailed trace in memory circular buffer and then you can tweak it to make it as small as your level 2 cache for instance. So it's pretty fast. Uh, and then whenever the latency tracker triggers, so a high latency has been discovered, then we can take a snapshot of what caused that latency and do further analysis on it. So the kernel tracer, uh, so there's, I have to repeat that, uh, no kernel patching is required since 2010, <laughs> so it's been six years now. Uh, and uh, now we can build it into the Linux kernel image, uh, so uh, we, we have a, a small uh, way to, to do this. Uh, and then uh, the kernel tracer can look at trace points, syscall entry and exit, and it gathers detailed argument content. So it's uh, closer in that respect to strace uh, than ftrace and perf. Uh, since it's really go and fetch user space uh, input and our output arguments. Uh, I cannot count k-probes and k-red probes. Uh, the user space tracer is a dynamically loaded shared library. Uh, it, the main goal there, uh, we don't want to go to the kernel in the fast path. Everything is done, uh, all the fast path is done in user space. Uh, and the, the goal there is really to perform fast user space tracing for applications that use uh, tracing very heavily. Uh, so it instruments, currently the instrumentation we have, uh, so we have implemented LTTNG USD trace points, uh, we have uh, traceF and trace log mechanism which is similar to printf but then it's being saved into the trace rather than being printed on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, the application uh, uh, STD app. Uh, we support uh, instrumentation of Java application with the Java JUL and Log4G loggers. So we have a, a logger that can uh, uh, connect to them. And we also have a Python logger uh, output that we can connect to Python. Uh, we can, over, uh, we can uh, instrument malloc and ptrip mutex uh, using symbol overrides by uh, loading uh, dynamically shared libraries, uh, as well as function entry and exit tracing. By comp but you currently need to recompile your application with uh, F instrument function. So it's, uh, it's pretty heavyweight currently for, for that, but it can be quite useful. One thing we added recently to it is uh, that we dump base addresses of all the shared objects as well uh, so we have the application information also with all the dwarf and elf information that's required to uh, let trace viewers uh, map instruction pointer addresses back to function, line numbers, shared object, offset and shared objects so we, we have all the mechanism in the user space tracer, as well as in uh, trace compass and bubble trace to do all that. So uh, now that we can take snapshots, uh, then those snapshots uh, can, those traces uh, can be analyzed in more detail. And there I'm going to present LTTNG analysis. Uh, you can also, for more details on LTTNG analysis, uh, Jérémy Galapno is giving a talk tomorrow and he's going to go in uh, more depth uh, in this. Um, so it's for offline analysis of traces. So we have implemented uh, analysis script for CPU uh, usage, memory usage, I/O latencies, interrupts, scheduling, system calls. Uh, so there's a lot of information uh, there that's being given. So we have uh, the, the classes of analysis that we have defined is uh, giving a frequency distribution of occurrence of a given uh, latency. Um, a top of the worst case latency, and then a log of everything that's over a threshold. Uh, and we do that for input output latency, interrupt, soft interrupt, uh, scheduling, uh, wake up to scheduling latency. And uh, also, we uh, now support uh, user defined periods. So uh, a user could define that they're interested in specific events along with specific uh, event arguments, and they can define their own period with a begin and end match, uh, and we are also support nested periods uh, and all sorts of things. So if you, so that's a good place to start if you want to uh, do custom analysis for your, your application. You don't even have to write Python code to do that. And it's uh, integrated with the TraceCompass uh, Trace uh, graphical user interface. So now about TraceCompass. So now that we have uh, some higher level information about uh, what happened uh, during the time before the long latency. We can use Trace Compass to dig in a graphical user interface and look at what was happening. Um, so it's very useful to basically correlate the, the analysis information with detailed uh, graphical representation of the trace. It does implement its own analyses 
And we have uh, designed a uh, JSON interface that we call uh, LEMI uh, to interact uh, between trace compass and external analysis scripts. So you can create your own scripts and populate information into trace compass. So that's an, uh, two example views of uh, trace compass. Uh, so we have here a portrait view where we, we have uh, my uh, uh, window manager along with Firefox running in it in various, uh, going through various syscalls running in user space and then uh, at the bottom we have kind of the resource view where we have uh, the, the various CPUs on the system along with the various interrupt lines uh, we have soft interrupts lower in the view so, uh, and this is all correlated uh, so you can stack multiple views and they are all synced together uh, and then this is rather newer so this is the integration between external analyses and trace compass. So the idea is uh, trace compass involves an <coughs> external analysis on a given trace, on, on the trace you're working on. You can uh, select specific time ranges that you're interested in and run those analysis on those time ranges. And then the, um, the analysis is going to give you a table. And then the, uh, the user can populate such uh, histograms and XY chart uh, currently from those tables. And this is an example histogram that I created. So this is a frequency distribution of the interrupt handler duration. So at the bottom, we have interrupt handler for keyboard, for my mouse. Uh, I have also network card uh, as well as Wi-Fi. And then we can see, so this is a multi-series uh, frequency distribution and the buckets are the duration of the interrupt handlers. So the ones at the right took the most time, the one at the, left, at, at the left were the fastest. And then we can clearly see in the blue one at the right, and this is actually my I8042 interrupt one interrupt, which is as a few item, well actually takes the most time. Uh, and we can look at, uh, for a IWL Wi-Fi, we can see that it's near the middle there. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a nice way to represent information and think about what are the outliers and which ones uh, do you care about. So another way, so some people are less uh, uh, interested in graphical user interface, so we also do batch mode analysis. Uh, so all the LTTNG analysis work also in batch mode uh, and output to the console, uh, in addition to being integrated with the graphical user interface. And there we have bubble trace, which is really the building stone uh, upon which the uh, uh, analysis are, are created. So it's a, a common trace format, trace reader and converter. Uh, it does all the time correlation between streams and everything, uh, so we don't have to care about it at the analysis level. It exposes C, C++, Python APIs uh, to read CTF traces. So the CTF traces are created by uh, LTTNG. And now a few other tracers. Uh, including perf, which can create CDF traces now. Uh, and it uh, can also be used to simply print, print traces into a text line. Yeah. Uh, and now it's time for, for the uh, periodic use case demo, for which we're going to use a Jack uh, audio uh, server application. So I'm going to let the uh, take it. Yeah. Hi. So before starting, I will going to show you how the latency tracker works and we are going to start by just instrumenting the network interrupt and logging uh, by SSH in a virtual machine and I'm just going to show you how to link an interrupt to the SSH process in this case. So first I'm going to load the latency tracker module. If we look at, I am going to use ftrace for this first demo because it outputs trace events, so it can work with both ftrace and ftc. I'm enabling the latency tracker event and pressing trace ftrace. Um, and I'm going to set the threshold to one nanosecond. So that would be really just how to see everything that's happening. So as you can see, we have output in the console. If I hit enter, we see that my SSHD has been woken up. And we see the delay between the interrupt and the time SSH actually started to work. If we want more details, we can output the text breakdown. It takes a bit more resources to do that, but it's still very interesting. And now, when I hit the key into my SSH console, 
we see that we have the full path from the do IRQ, which is the entry point for interrupts in the camera, down to the IRQ render entry. We see the delta. How long it took between the do IRQ to the start of the render entry? Just one point, so the, the time here is in nanoseconds. Nanosecond. After that, we see the start IRQ wave and the delay before that, start IRQ entry, which ended up waking up the task. And finally, it gets switched in, which started to make SSF on the CPU. So the delay at the beginning is the delay for the full chain, and that's the threshold to specify. So if you are interested in more longer uh, occurrences, you just have to change the, the delay and see immediately the breakdown. You can also not enable the breakdown and just use this as an entry point in the trace. So if you don't want to use any tracing tools and you are familiar with just processing the trace manually in text, that's a good way to have a precise entry point in the trace and then look around in this event to see what happened before to explain why the latency occurred. So that's a simple example with just uh, SSH which waits for an interrupt. Now I'm going to show you an example with Jack, which is a module server. Jack is interesting because it's periodic. It waits for, uh, it has a thread call uh, timer and just reads samples from the sound card. So if you start... Uh, as I remember, it's driven by the sound card, but the, the period, uh, it fixes the period at which the sound card takes samples, yes. which is in this case 21, uh, 21. 3 milliseconds. Yeah. So in this example, we are going to start Jack on the and it's pinned on the CPU zero, and I'm just going to add some uh, problems to CPU zero. It's set with the priority one and on the CPU zero. If we look at the beginning of Jack, we see that the period is 21 milliseconds. So every 21 milliseconds, it reads a sample. It detects also if it didn't if it misses a period we will see an output in the, the console. Now if I, just to show you this, if I just run the CPU burn on the same CPU, we see that Jack detected uh, X run, so for under run for 700 milliseconds. So just by running a higher priority on the same CPU, Jack detects that. Now we're going to use the latency tracker to do the same kind of detection. So I'm going to use a uh, script that I made because it can be a to, to do a demo. But it's basically creating a LTNG session because we want to see what happened before the occurrence. So we are going, like Matthew said, to record background information. And at the end, when higher latency is detected, we are going to just have a full trace of the previous uh, to make of trace. So I'm creating a snapshot session, enabling all current events LTNG can hook up, and also enabling all user space event. So if the application is instrumented in user space, we also see what's happening inside. I'm configuring the threshold to 25 milliseconds, so it's a bit higher than the jack period, so we are sure that when this triggers, it's because jack had an issue. We are tracking IRQ, not timer, so timer tracing is disabled. And we are filtering on the Jack process, so only Jack uh, related events will uh, be triggering the wake up. When the latency tracker detects a high latency, it will wake up the path. So I will just have a process, here it's cat, that's waiting on a wake up pipe. And when the latency tracker detects a uh, high latency, we just wake up this pipe, it will return, and then we will stop the tracing session and extract the memory to disk so that we can do uh, processing on the trace. So that's how we trigger user space action. We just have to wait on the pipe and you will kind of wind it. So I'm executing this. Now I'm recording the trips. If we now start CPU burn like I did before, we see that 
the console here got some action and we see LTNG snapshot recorded. We also see that we had a buffer overrun of 400 milliseconds. Now if we look inside the trace folder, we see a snapshot with both UST, so user space tracing, and we see it was a trace on root. If we look inside, that's because I instrumented quickly Jack to have the period begin and end, and also when the error are detected. So we can use only the space trace if you want. But in this case, we are more interested in the, the camel trace. So here are the few seconds before the, the problem. And we are going to use the scan top uh, analysis to process the trace and see if we have high scheduling differences. Here we see the first one is the process that we were trying to wake up, which is Jack, because the interrupt arrived, we tried to wake up Jack, but uh, the process was already busy under the CPU zero. So we see the current priority of Jack and how long it took between the waking and the switch. If we now use this time range, we can see what was happening on the CPU at this time. So I'm just running the same, uh, different analysis here, it's at the CPU top, but on the time range that we detected before, so it's only analyzing the period where the high latency occurred. And now we see not what I was expecting, but that's just to <laughs> give you an idea. Uh, we have here the breakdown of what was happening. If we want to see the really what was happening, I have a working example in case this happened. So here, that's the same example we have kernel wake up delay for Jack. And if we run this the top on this time range, we'll see the CPU burn that's using the full CPU and it has a higher priority than Jack. Uh, why did it happen before that? Because the trace buffer are too small to have the full context, so that's why we have a bit uh, missing information, but that can be around with the configuration. So that's an example with periodical uh, use case where the process detects that, it can detect by itself that the high latency occurred, but, so it could by itself record the snapshot, it could just trigger the action of extracting the trace and then launching post-processing. Now what's interesting is when we talk about the other use cases, so in like SSH, it's waiting for an interrupt to start running. In this case, we are going to demo with memcache, which is a distributed in-memory object caching system. And we are first going to show how long it takes before the, between the interrupt and the start of memcache. So we can just start processing the, the data it's receiving on the network. And we are going to introduce a kernel level latency. In this case, it's just a synthetic use case, just slowing down the IRQ handler by a few milliseconds. And we will see that we can measure an actual latency for the client, even though Memcache has no idea it got slowed down by something else. So, if I look. Also, just before, uh, I want to show you quickly uh, in the snapshot that we also have the latency tracker in it. So, we have the same information that I was showing with F-Trace. We also have it inside the XDNG snapshot. So, it can also be used as the entry point if you are just want to work with the trace on it. And it's correlated with the user space event. So, if you look inside the trace, you will see this event and also the Jack event that we're recording only in user space. So now I'm going to show you the, the small driver I'm going to insert quickly inside. So it's just hooking on the IRQ handler uh, trace point and slowing down my network interface, network uh, IRQ handler. If I start and cache and connect client, we see the kind of latency we get. I'm just running this knife. I uh, start the latency tracker. 
it was 36 to 75 milliseconds, approximately. So, and if we look inside the latency tracker, we see the same kind of information, but just for each uh, interrupt, we got, I think it's three uh, comments that are sent <coughs> by this comment, so we see three, three interrupts. And here we are only filtering on main cache process, so that's why when I hit enter, we don't see my SSH command. So if we look at the delay, we have it here, around here. And if I insert the driver and quickly enter, start the main cache request, we will see this kind of delay. So we are now arriving around 200 milliseconds, which is the delay. Uh, that I am inserting into the driver. And we see also that the client got slowed down by 100 milliseconds. So even though Memcache has no idea it got slowed down, the client perceived it. So you can use this information to explain the user latency by just extracting the, the characters. If we look inside here, we will see that most of the time is of course spent inside the AI render entry because that's where we inserted the, the latency. So that's for the, the delay between the interrupt and the start of the target process. Now there are some complex use cases like memcache where you want to see up to the end of processing, so inside the application. When just looking at the camera trace, it can be really hard to see this kind of delay because you have so many possible uh, interactions between the processes and the camera. So you want to have some help from the user space. So in this case, I'm going to use the same process, memcache, and working with the... I'm going to configure the latency tracker to track user space. So wait up to the time where the user space application informs the camera that it finished working on the on something. So and I'm going to insert the uh, login. Login, that's it. So now I'm working on the remote server launching uh, Um, so, because I'm on the VM, it's not really a, a good way to, to show this kind of delay. So, we see that our client can connect on this interface. And I'm going to show with the Latin tracker put on the same uh, terminator is dying. Same configuration, that in Striker enable F-Trace, login, and cache filter. And now we are enabling the outward, which is a condition to inform the Latin Striker that we only want to output something when the work has been completed in user space. So here you have done some instrumentation of memcache so that it yes. can tell when it starts and completes it. Work. So it's very easy. Well, all memcache has to do is to add write to the pipe. In the actions, so you just have to output something in work begin, work done at the end, the same output, and the tracker matches the two, and makes that in relation with the entry point in the camera which was the interrupt. So now, filtering here, on the cache, and starting the cache. So now we see when it's normal, we see latencies around 74, 40 microseconds for each interrupt. So if you look here around this area of the screen, you see the delays, which is the total delay for the chain. And now I'm going to use the same M cache, but with logging enabled. And we'll see that we'll see much higher 
latencies, even though it's still relatively small, it's uh, 20 microseconds higher than usual. So it can be really used to have fine grain uh, analysis. If now I change the threshold to let's say uh, 60 microseconds, so I won't see anything. Uh, see anything from normal request V60 is a bit optimistic now we don't see any from normal request ok, it was good good luck We are running in production, we don't want to have too much noise. So here we have determined that our normal use case is around 80 is never higher than 80 microseconds for processing in the app. Now if somebody launches and cache with logging, for example, we should see immediately that we have events that are generated so we know uh, that something is wrong. From this information, uh, we can use the wake up pipe, like I was seeing before, to, to trigger actions. So instead of putting the load, I can just wait here. And as you can see, my cat uh, command return. So I can do uh, so whenever I have a high latency, the process returns. So you can take action, you can send alerts, you can extract the snapshot reports. What kind of action do you want to do after the high latency of the video? All of that without having to look at the trees. So that's it for the okay. video. So in terms of uh, benchmarks, uh, so the example with uh, Memcached, uh, benchmark of Memcached through a gigabit interface doing 10,000 requests. So the baseline, it took about uh, 491 milliseconds. But, and with the tracker enabled 520 milliseconds with a forward overhead of uh, roughly 6% per percent. Uh, if you want to add this one. That's more uh, micro benchmark, just to give you an idea. Here are stress tests for this kind of uh, workload. So if it's high CPU workload, it doesn't do any interrupt, so you shouldn't see any overhead. For memory, we see a bit overhead. The most uh, impacted uh, subsystems are, of course, the file I/O because they are doing lots of uh, interrupts. And if we want to use uh, and the network, if you don't have any, uh, in this case, it's IPERF, so just networking, no disk I/O, we don't see any impact on the gigabit count. For 10 gigabits, we could see some overhead, and it's fluctuating. It's not that. Uh, Robust, but it could be based on much other factors. OLTP here is a test that stress test MySphere, so you have networking, IO, and uh, mean spreading uh, workload, so it's the more realistic workload, and we have a variety of around 4%, so it matches what we see around here with main cache in case of stress test. If we want to go deeper inside the, the measurements, we measure what's happening inside the state system when we change from one state to the other. Because when you detect an IRQ that's related to uh, the process you're interested in, you will do a state transition. So most of the time you don't do any transition based on the events, because they are unrelated to what you're interested in. But where, when it happens, you see some uh, transition, and then it's around one microsecond for each transition. As we showed before, we have a chain of around six or seven events from the interrupt to the start of running in the user space. So we have an overhead of around eight microseconds for the full chain. 
So that's something you have to take into account if you are tracing real-time uh, sensitive applications. You can, as long as you can tolerate uh, the overhead of 8 microseconds for each <coughs> interval processing. So for the last future work, some ideas uh, we have. So basically, uh, the main contributions here are a log-free memory allocator, log-free hash table, uh, the latency tracker, uh, uh, Alberta, uh, and that could actually all be, so the, the latency tracker, uh, uh, the, so I'm talking here about the uh, in and out API, so all that could be provided uh, to EBTF scripts at some point. Uh, so that would, a big, uh, big win for that would be to provide NMI safe uh, uh, use of, uh, of uh, memory allocator and hash table, uh, so it could be hooked onto perf uh, NMIs that are triggered when performance counters overflow. Uh, so some future work would be could be to re-implement the latency tracker uh, online critical path analysis as EBPF uh, high, le high level code. So the reason why we did not do it is because all that development has been done in parallel with the development of EBPF in the past uh, two years or so. Uh, some links to uh, the LTTNG project. Uh, have a look at our blog. So we regularly post uh, do blog posts uh, where we detail some uh, uh, use cases and uh, real life scenario how to use the tools. Uh, so uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so a link to the latency tracker, the analysis scripts, trace compass, double trace, uh, common trace format. And uh, that's it. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Um. The examples you show essentially go cross-thread single process. Uh, is it possible for the latency tracker to work in a mode where it could go cross-process? Yes. Yeah. Uh, when the work begins, it hits. So when the thread that receives the event starts, uh, uh, receives the request, it just has to write a cookie inside the, the file. After that, the cookie can be closed by any, from anywhere inside the, the machine. So it just has to be unique for the duration of the workload. So it could be a job ID. Could be a, in this case, it was the socket number. So I know that it's only tracking this request from the beginning to the end. But the, the key is really just a string. So you can just have to make sure that it's unique and that it's uh, inserted just when you receive the packet or the interrupt. Another question? Yeah, I'll, I'll go again. Um, how uh, customizable, how, how easy is it to customize, if at all, the uh, latency tracker output? The output is pretty hard in the, the code. You can just configure if you want the text breakdown or not. Because okay. adding the text takes some time because you have to manipulate string inside the camel uh, core part of internal processing. But that's the only output configurable option. Other questions? Feel free to come talk to us uh, right after. We'll be uh, we'll be around. Thank you.